We're here today uh, for our annual Power Breakfast event, which is our opportunity to provide highlights on some of the activities over the past year. And then we'll also do a little bit of look forward and our financial forecast and our outlook for 2023. Uh, and then we'll leave some time for Q&A at the end. So that's, this is always a good opportunity to take a few questions about where we're headed as a utility. I always like to take the opportunity during these type of events to talk about the benefits of being a municipal utility here in Muscatine. And I think we're really lucky to have this structure. And when I think about a municipal utility, the three benefits I think of, local control. So you have local leadership from the board level to the senior leadership team to many of our staff that are making decisions specifically for what's in the best interest of the Muscatine community. And I think that stuff makes a big impact. We talk about low rates, not profits. I like to say there's nothing wrong with profits, certainly in the business world. But in our case, it's just not an additional factor. Uh, we are a nonprofit, so our goal is to provide the lowest rates for our customers while still delivering the level of services that they expect. And the last is neighbors serving neighbors. I really think this is important because your team here, most of our staff that work at MPW, we're serving our neighbors, our friends, our family. We know that the decisions we make and the actions we take are going to impact the people that we live near and around. And I really think that makes a difference when it comes to customer service and decision making. So you know, uh, we do have a local uh, board of trustees, and we've got a couple of them here today. Thank you so much for being here today, and thank you for your service. Uh, these are faces that you know, that you run into, that you serve on committees with. Uh, these are the folks that are leading this utility for you. And we are very lucky to have a talented, dedicated, uh, board of Trustees, so thank you. And then this is your senior leadership team. I can tell you I am very proud to be a part of this team, uh, and I think the Muscatine community is very lucky to have such a talented set of senior leaders, and you'll get to hear from each of them today as we walk through these updates. So you may recall, if you've come to, to these before, we're actually two full years now into the new strategic plan that we rolled out for 2021. Uh, and I am actually amazed at the progress that our team has made uh, on that strategic plan over the past couple of years. And if you recall, we laid that out into four or five key strategies uh, that you see on the screen here. And so today we're going to walk through just a few highlights on some of these strategies over the past year. But we really have made great strides even within 2022 in furthering developing our leadership and our staff, uh, better leveraging technology to make our operations more efficient, continuous improvement culture is getting expanded throughout the utility. We're, giving, we're improving our customer experience and rolling out even a brand new customer information system that Erica will talk about. We invested over $15 million in capital projects last year, most of those for infrastructure and things that are, will improve or maintain the reliability of the system. We took another major step forward, another milestone in our Power in the Future plan in 2022, and Doug will talk about that. And then we continue to grow our service our services. We leveraged grant funding to expand uh, electric vehicle adoption in Muscatine and also to start providing high-speed fiber internet services to a broader range of the Muscatine community. So you get to hear some of those updates today. And our plan is not to provide a comprehensive update on the progress of our strat plan, but just pull out a few highlights from over the past year in these categories and, and try to really drive home how the objectives that we have here are serving to make your community a better. And with that, we'll roll right in to strategy one. Good morning. Uh, I get to start talking about one of our greatest resources here at MPW, our employees. With the continuing number of uh, good, good number of retirements and changing business needs at the utilities, we've um, begun reinvesting and um, in investing in staff development and training. We want our staff to be successful not only in their current roles, but in the next opportunity that's available for them at Power & Water. Um, inspired by Toastmasters, we um, started a uh, public speaking training um, with a similar group. We call it Toasties. Any given month, there's 10 to 20 employees that are meeting to build relationships with each other through all different levels of the utility and develop their speaking and presentation skills. HR hosts study halls with internal um, subject matter experts. This is a great way for our more experienced staff to share knowledge about internal systems, processes, and projects. Um, supervisor roundtables let supervisors learn and support each other in handling those issues that come with people leadership. We have an HR book club with about 20 participants from across the organization each quarter. Um, the group picks the book. We make some suggestions. 
Um, they pick the book and we provide it in whatever format they need and then we have a, a good discussion about the content of the book and its relevance to the work we're doing. Um, one of the books we read this summer what, was, was doing the, what must be done by Chad Hymas and that was actually tied in with a visit that was sponsored by our safety department that brought Chad Hymas on site and some of you may have seen him at your workplaces too. He talked to us about his experience at a near-death farm accident um, that left him paralyzed. And he talked about the impact on him, his family, his career. Um, Chad's now a rancher and a public speaker, but before that he was a power line um, construction contractor. So a lot of what he shared had a lot of relevance to the work we do at the utility. His message um, and his presentation and his book what gave a, you know, reinforced the belief that accidents are avoidable and the importance of keeping safety at the forefront of everything we do. And we do support our staff in their career development. We think the pursuit of advanced credentials reflects their commitment to being professionals and their reflective discipline. We encourage staff to pursue micro-credentials too. Sometimes that's a little more attainable and the time, the time invested is, is easier. Um, we partner with MCC. They're a great resource to, for local training resources um, and is also uh, provides a lot of the training we need for our skills traits. Our wellness team does our best. We, our wellness team is very active at MPW. Now, we know that doing your best at work requires you to take care of yourself, and the MPW employee wellness team offers a number of activities throughout the year with an emphasis on physical, mental, and financial well-being. So our robust safety programs help our employees to be reliable on the job and then be there for their families after the workday is done. It also helps to keep costs down for our customers. Our field and plant staff do very high risk work in very challenging situations, but they look out for each other and they're always looking for ways to make their job safer. We wrapped up 2002 with four OSHA recordable injuries and that's tied for our second lowest since 1972. And considering um, the amount of work that gets done at the utility and then especially in the generation department where they work comparable hours but with less people, it's a really great achievement. Now our goal remains zero accidents and we'll continue to work towards that in 2023. We strive to benchmark against some of the best utilities in the country, and we will submit work from our marketing department to the American P Public Power Association to be judged against some of the best utilities in the country. We were honored that our IMMPW video series, which features Doug and other generation employees talking about our Powering the Future strategy, received an award of excellence, and our Powering the Future webpage, which also shares information about this important strategy, received an award of merit. In a new continuous improvement venture, the past few months, we've been working with the Iowa Quality Center to educate ourselves on and compare our operations against a set of performance excellence benchmarks. This is part of the Iowa Recognition for Excellence program, which is based on the Baldridge framework. The on-site review of our application will happen in April, and what we're really doing is pushing ourselves beyond just comparing ourselves to other utilities, but best practices in all types of businesses. We also added two new Lean Six Sigma belts to our ranks this year. One of our CAD techs earned her green belt, and our manager of transmission and distribution earned his black belt. So it's great to see this level of engagement at all levels of the organization. And the visual on the right shows our ongoing <coughs> investment in the culture of improvement. We had 532 suggestions come in from our folks last year to make things better, safer, and more efficient. Each of those suggestions is evaluated by the team, and if approved, it's given the support to put it into practice. This is a look at our new five-year capital projects map. This includes projects from the city and MPW. The interactive map allows us to look ahead and see where the work is being done and by who. It gives us a quick summary of the work and the investment being made in each neighborhood. With a quick look, we can make sure that we're aligning our efforts. The worst thing that can happen when we're planning projects is not coordinating with our partners. We don't want the city to tear up a street, do their work, and we miss that opportunity. And the next year, we have to tear up the street because we're going to inconvenience our customers again, and we're going to drive those costs up. So it's going to be a top priority for our GIS team to meet with our partners and keep this map up to date as we look ahead. Our next step will be to share this in a forward-facing map out to our customers so they can use it as well. They'll know what's happening in their neighborhood, the status of the project, and even how to avoid those construction areas. 
As the need for high-speed, reliable internet continues to grow, MPW initiated a restructure of our internet packages mid-year, eliminating lower speed options and making higher speed options more affordable. This follows industry best practices to right size offerings and optimize customer experience with fewer and better bandwidth options. We successfully implemented phase one internet restructure on our residential and business class shared fiber to the home network. With a combination of multiple bandwidth and pricing changes, the highly coordinated efforts of our communications operations group, customer services, marketing, and IT completed the changes seamlessly with no negative operational impacts. Customers responded favorably and have taken advantage of low-cost upgrades. Since the restructure, we've seen a significant increase in the number of our gig signups, showing that the new price point was a move in the right direction. With goals to have 100 meg as our entry service and get gig pricing to under $100, look for phase two restructure in 23. We lowered rates for our managed MAN, which is an enterprise service, our MAN internet, MDC, and unleased fiber service. MAN and MDC services provide dedicated bandwidth that is monitored for several conditions at the customer level, including out of service and bandwidth usage. This is for critical business services. To create a better experience for our customers, we launched NixPix in December. Now when you select the on-demand button on your remote, five hit movies will be featured for easy rental. Additionally, a folder of hot and popular titles has approximately 50 titles of fan favorite movies at your fingertips. Hundreds of titles are still available if there is a specific movie that you're looking for. We love hosting customer appreciation days and have great volunteers who continually envision new activities to help customers learn more about their community utility. We took guests on a tour through our Grandview Avenue Wellfield, the site of our future Muscatine Solar One project, and ended the visit into our power plant site. Guests young and young at heart alike got to play a news reporter covering a story about a local Godzilla sighting as a tie to all the community production we have on MPW Fiber TV. Last year's event was educational, hands-on, fun, and memorable for over 600 guests. Seems like we've been talking about our new CIS for months, and um, after nearly 30 years with our current customer information system, we transitioned to iView Connect on Monday, seamlessly, kind of. <laughs> the internet did not go out on Super Bowl Sunday, which was one of my big fears. Um, but we've had a fantastic cross-functional project team working to go live with the new system over the past year. Many, many screens and processes are changing for our office staff. Field crews are going paperless and will now close out their own work orders. Even our system control group will manage outages through iView. Customers will see a new bill design. We're generating our first bills today. And uh, with additional information to help them better understand their utility usage and a new shorter account number. Certain auto pay customers will need to re-register to reactivate auto pay, and we've sent postcards and emails to those folks to remind them of that. In the age of doing business via a smartphone or tablet, MPW customers have been asking for an app, and iView Smart Hub offers both an online web portal and mobile app. With Smart Hub, you can view usage and billing, manage your payments, notify a customer of account and service issues, and receive special messaging from MPW iView connects multiple accounts with the same customer name. If you, if your business or you personally have multiple accounts, we really think that you'll like this feature. Now that we're in the new system, we have some easier ways to help you connect multiple accounts to make it easier to manage payments across your multiple uh, properties or to track account usage. Rachel Reed, our customer services manager is in the back and she was one of the co-leads of the CIS project. She's with us today, and she'd be happy to demo Smart Hub after the meeting or even help you get signed up if you'd like. Phase two ideas are being considered. We know there's going to be additional uh, efficiencies to be realized and that we can eliminate some specialty software programs by launching additional iView modules and integrating data into one platform. MPW is a fan of solar, and we're adding solar to our own portfolio in a big way. We've also updated our policies to make it easier for you to add solar to your home. Unfortunately, we continue to hear some horror stories about people's interaction with some solar developers. Sometimes they just make promises they can't keep. 
If you're interested in installing a solar system at your home or business, we want your solar investment to work well with no surprises. So always get MPW involved in the conversation early. Paul Burbeck is our energy services advisor. He's our solar expert, and he can help you with a lot of things. He can verify promised payback calculations, confirm the installation will fit on our system with no required upgrades, which can drive up your costs, and he'll also answer any other questions that you have. This last year, we spent a, lime, a lot of time reaching out to people talking about solar, and we developed a, a nice catchphrase. If you're looking at adding solar, better call Paul. MPW always gives the top priority to outages, and this year we were able to expand that outside of our service territory. After Hurricane Ian hit land in September, the call for mutual aid went out, and MPW quickly responded. We were able to send three people down to New Smyrna Beach to aid in the recovery efforts. A big thanks goes out to Dave Scott, Barry Garretson, and Chad Benke. <clears throat> they spent a week just south of Daytona helping a utility in need, and we want to also have a big thanks go out to their families for supporting them. Very good. Um, we are active throughout the community supporting organizations and events that let us connect with our neighbors and make Muscatine a great place to work. Um, if you happen to attend the holiday jingle and mingle this year, we had great weather, which uh, resulted in an amazing turnout, and lots of photo opportunities with our lighted um, line truck. Our employees got to show off their creativity and craftsmanship creating the display. We gave out calendars and conducted a giveaway for customers to receive gift certificates, so Santa came for a few customers. We also like to share our, no our knowledge and skills in classrooms and supporting community projects. Some examples, um, MCSD's Summer Spark Program, um, the providing electrical safety demos in classrooms throughout the district, as well as at the community block party. We helped with a Habitat for Humanity house build and also support United Way projects. Now to show appreciation for our first responders, MPW commissioned painting, uh, the painting of two decommissioned hydrants and honored our dedicated professionals from the Muscatine Fire and Police Department with the installation of these art pieces at the Public Safety Building. And being a good neighbor and supporting our community takes all forms, um, from everything from having every, tree, every tag on our angel tree taken care of by employees, to having employees donate um, car loads of food and toys during the holiday drives, to having the water crew help a customer whose car became disabled right near their job site. As you drive into Muscatine, you're welcomed by four giant City of Muscatine signs, and they were getting in pretty poor repair. Many of the light bulbs were burnt out, and uh, they were in need of update to modern LED high-efficient bulbs. So MPW crews installed eight new lamps and repaired photo cells so that they're only on when necessary. And if you haven't seen them, they are brighter than ever. Uh, the signs really look great. The city did a great job cleaning up a lot of the uh, landscape around them. And we were also able to redirect one of the lights on top of a pole that lights the flag at the bridge park. When Second Street was re, uh, the sidewalks were rebuilt, MPW worked with the city to install two USB charging stations and nine downtown load centers. And those are just load centers that you can plug into and use for different events. Those can be used for things like jingle mingle, block parties, parades, or any chamber approved event. Before the new installation, these were rented out by Parks and Rec at the city. But then you had to come to MPW to sign up for service, so it was a little bit clunky. Well, the chamber took the opportunity to get involved, and now we've numbered those load centers. All you have to do is look at the number, walk into the chamber, fill out a quick application, and they'll take care of the whole thing right there. So a big thanks to the chamber for streamlining that process for everyone. This year we had a lot of investments in reliability, and a lot of these were new things we haven't done before. The biggest one was line 106, and we got that completed and in service. We cut the ribbon on September 9th, and the line is adding value to Muscatine as a major path for power in and out of our system. It delivers more flexibility for outages and greater resilience through route diversity as it's a completely different path in and out of our city. We've been focusing more on outages lately as the power grid has been stressed with winter storms and capacity shortfalls. From a continuous improvement perspective, one outage event that we drill for is a loss of communications on our substation ring. What happens if we would lose that communication is we have to send crews out to each substation. Then every 20 minutes, they need to write down those readings, call those into the control center. The control center has to answer all those calls, rewrite down that information, 
and it's very slow moving, and it us actually allows room for a lot of errors to happen. Well, using GIS again as a solution, they've created dashboards on their tablets. Now the crews can input that data right into the dashboard. It uses a separate communication path, and now all that data appears right in front of our system operations team so they're aware of what's going on at those substations, and it's just a fantastic improvement. It's almost like having real-time values without having real-time values. Next, we started expanding our scope of incident command and the size of our team. We used to do a lot of this informally, but now when there is an emergency on the grid, we have a formal process where we bring the team together, we evaluate <coughs> our system, we make sure that we're working closely with MISO, we look at the offers of our units and make sure that they're updated so MISO knows what we can do to support the grid, and we're also working closely with staff to how we're, how we're going to make sure we contact our customers and our key accounts. So doing all that uh, together formally puts us in a great position to weather those storms. Next is reliability. <coughs> and we've hit five nines. As far as our availability to serve our customers, this is a target we're always shooting for, 99.999. This isn't the first time we've hit this number. We did it in 2018, 2016, 2010, and 2008. Before that, records were maintained a little differently. So we have a great history of being available to serve our customers' reliability. We also just received our fourth consecutive RP3, which is Reliable Public Power Provider Diamond Award from the American Public Power Association. That's a mouthful. But the diamond rating is the highest rating that you can get, and that's four in a row. The 2022 totals aren't in yet, but when we compare our results up here to the last couple of years, we plan to place in the top 40th in all of these areas, and that's taking into account there's over 700 utilities that participate in these metrics across the country. Last, you may remember that we completed our lower pole wrap installation last year. It was put in place so that we could keep squirrels from getting up to poles and getting on the fiber optics because they like to chew on that and they were creating some issues for us. Well, a byproduct of that was now they can't get to the electrical as well either. Where we had been having about 19 incidents in a year, we only had nine squirrel-related outages last year. So it was definitely a step in the right direction. And a big thanks to the communications team and Erica for budgeting and coming up with the idea for that project because it served both utilities very well. Our West Hill pumping station on Kindler was constructed in 1965, and many of those original electrical components were still in operation. That station is responsible for pumping water up to the tower, which supplies the high side, what we call the high side, which is East Hill and Muscatine. A new motor control center and electric service was needed to improve the reliability. As we took a look at the project, we reviewed to see what else we could do to make improvements. We right-sized the pumps. They were 4,000 gallon per minute, and we dropped those down to 2,500. Those larger pumps created some problems as they would kick on and off, and they could create disruptions on the system and even pockets of discolored water. With the smaller pumps, we're still able to meet our demand at peak, and they do it much more efficiently using less power. This year, the exterior of the pump house and the square reservoir structures just north of them will be addressed. We'll be making the property look nicer, extending the life of those structures, and get the appearance to the level that reflects the MPW brand. We know reliable internet is just as important to you as reliable power. Since our fiber to the home project completed, we've completed, we've continued to make network improvements during overnight maintenance windows. Add to that the collaboration with Ryan's T&D group on the lower pole band wraps, and these efforts have resulted in steadily improving reliability stats for our internet, TV, and fixed wireless services. Continued reliability initiatives are planned for 2023 as we, too, pursue five nines for comms reliability. In an effort to achieve best-in-class communication system reliability, the communications team replaced the entire backbone infrastructure for the enterprise manned network in 2021 and built redundant network fiber paths to provide seamless failover. In 22, new routing paths were built for each of our enterprise customers. Edge equipment was replaced, and those customers were physically moved to the new network. The newly refreshed hardware platform can provide up to 10 gigabits per second max per, per connection of dedicated internet bandwidth. 
We also can provide up to 100 gigabits per second of dedicated bandwidth between local locations and any co-located hardware housed in our efficiently optimized and hardened network operations center. For residential and business class customers on our shared fiber to the home network, upgrades to equipment in our, in our NOC began to increase shared capacity to 10 gigabits download and 10 gigabits upload. Because fiber capacity is nearly limitless and MPW has fiber to every home and business, these upgrades are implemented with minimal additional investment and require no field construction work. Both our MAN and fiber to the home networks are designed to easily scale with bandwidth usage growth, providing a better internet product and enhancing customer experience. As we invest responsibly in reliability for corporate IT, we continue to focus on cybersecurity improvements. We require MFA for all connectivity to our internal and cloud infrastructure. We increased our password length and complexity requirements for domain access, access and IT staff audited all elevated access and administrative user accounts to implement a least privileged access model for administrators. Thanks to the work of Brandy's group, uh, educating our employees on cybersecurity and how prone we are to it as a utility, we had pretty easy adoption by our employee body. We improved our backup and recovery solution and with added redundancy, new immutable storage, and increased data retention. We upgraded our endpoint device management platform for all Windows, Android, and iOS devices. And based on equipment and process changes since our last audit, we saw improved results from our 2022 third-party penetration and social engineering test. MPW has multiple layers in place of security to defend against risks and threats that come with technology. We also have numerous environments to protect that each have their own unique risks and operational requirements. We have a corporate network, the ISP, operations technology like the plant DCS and SCADA systems. We are part of the bulk electric system and have to operate to the national reliability and critical infrastructure protection standards. We use know before to address phishing because we know email is the easiest way for a bad guy to get into one of our systems. We're tied in to the industry, national, state, and local levels to maintain situational awareness and, and be aware of evolving threats and risks. And we participate in incident response training, recovery plan tests, and tabletop exercises to verify our procedures, prepare in case of emergencies, and challenge problem solving skills with unique challenges that might come up. So um, <clears throat> for the Power and Future objective, it's, it's really looking at a balanced approach. We're going to increase sustainability in the system while maintaining reliability and affordability while leaving a, leaving a spot open for flexibility for future additions as that technology evolves. Uh, this is something that's discussed every month at our board meeting, multiple uh, other public events, and our next one is going to be uh, March 6, 2023, and I would encourage everybody, everybody here to attend that meeting. It's a great chance for your voice to be heard. Our first objective was to expand the renewable portfolio. So the uh, 2020 or the 24 megawatt Muscatine Solar One project is taken off at Muscatine's Grandview Avenue Wellfield site. Uh, it's anticipated that construction is going to start in the fourth quarter of 2024, with that unit coming online in 2025. Uh, the this. Uh, if you probably recall, back in November of 2022, the power purchase agreement was signed with Nokomis Energy to get this project started. Since then, they've been working on development items like site design, getting permitting, financing, and environmental assessments, while MPW has been working on the uh, MISO interconnection as well as the local physical interconnection. That's a project Ryan's group is working on. So the support of GPCH and I and Bear were really key to making this thing happen through our Choose Green Muscatine business program. It's super important. But there's still an opportunity if you want to participate in this program. Our staff has been reaching out to commercial two and industrial customers just to gauge interest to see if they're interested. So if you haven't been contacted and if you are interested in part of this project, better call uh, Paul. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> Better call Paul, he's the guy. Uh, and our residential customers can continue to participate in, through, in all of MPW renewable projects through the Choose Green Muscatine program. So on our Powering the Future objective, we've been working, we worked with Lidos Engineering on the 2020 power supply study. 
since then, we've been working on follow-up items with, uh, with, with LIDOS. The recommendations were to follow up on getting local pricing on a uh, solar project, kind of went a little beyond, and uh, we've actually got one rolling now. The other piece was to follow up on the combined heat and power unit, do a detailed study to figure out what the exact performance and uh, thermal characteristics were going to be of that unit here in Muscatine. So, and also update the cost data. So we worked with Stanley Consultants on that first. Then that information was rolled into uh, rolled back into another rerun of the power supply study that we plan to share with the board this at this month's board meeting. Again, we'll also follow up with that same presentation at the customer forum on March 6. Again, I can't say this enough. Uh, this forum is a great opportunity to, uh, to, to voice your priorities and concerns for your business. This is a CO2 slide that represents MPW's climate actions as they compare to the global actions and targets and goals through 2050. And, and the key is the, uh, on the y-axis there's a percentage of reduction in CO2 to keep the, uh, the global warming less than two degrees C. And that's indicated by the teal line. The green line up on the top is what happens if we don't do anything. That purple line represents MPW's reductions in CO2. This slide now includes the uh, 2022 CO2 emissions as well as uh, the projection with unit or plant unit seven and eight operating as peaking units. And you can see the dotted line down there is MPW CO2 emissions target of 65%. And then uh, this is all gonna take time. So this transition is, it's really important to make this transition reliably and safely. So moving forward, units seven and eight are gonna operate as peaking units. This is a really important part given the uh, shortfalls in capacity in the MISO system, which, uh, which Ryan had pointed out previously, primarily di driven by uh, unit retirements in the system. So it's getting pretty tight out there. Uh, unfortunately, Unit 8A experienced an unplanned outage in December. It happened on December 23rd. You probably remember it was a little chilly out, December 23rd. And uh, due to a long repair time frame, a mutual decision was made with GPC to end that steam sales contract a few weeks early. That unit's gonna remain in outage until we can get uh, decommissioning efforts started. This unique arrangement has really been mutual bene mutually beneficial for over 22 years. I've been involved with the, the from the incep inception. And uh, provides steam at a, at a competitive rate while also providing some revenue that help reduce the electric rates for everybody in Muscatine. So it's been a win-win for a long time. And Unit 9 continues to operate as MPW's main source of local generation. In growing our electric services, <coughs> MPW has installed four level two EV chargers throughout the community. Three with funding from the Iowa DOT using the Volkswagen settlement funds. Along with MPW, driving around, I can count about eight level two chargers and one DC fast charger that's now installed in Muscatine. We also just received an application for four DC fast chargers to be installed later this year. Gage jokes sometimes that Muscatine may have more chargers per capita than anywhere in the country, but we're definitely doing our best to take advantage of these grants and share those opportunities with our neighbors. As we look at our own fleet, we're always evaluating electric vehicles. And it's not just for cars and light trucks. We consider it an option for all types of equipment. We recently ordered two large bucket trucks with GEMS units. And GEMS is Job Site Energy Management Systems. So anywhere on our system, we have to get our large trucks out there. And it takes a big diesel to do that and pull those big trailers. But once they're on site, that large diesel has to idle all day to power the hydraulics, climate control the cab, so they can do their work. Well, now we're looking at a battery system with this GEMS unit that will handle all that. So once they drive to the site, that big diesel is shut down and it reduces emissions and fuel consumption. And if they're in your backyard, it's going to be a lot quieter too. Last, we're supporting the city in their pursuit of two electric buses. We wrote a letter of support and are working with them on charging options and we wish them the best of luck with their application. Our new MeshNet service is the next ev evolution of our enterprise man service and is, is designed to give customers more reliability and cost savings. No matter the physical location they are in, MeshNet customers will be able to access the same internal services as if they were in the same building. 
Physical barriers and bandwidth limitations are no longer an issue between phys different physical locations since the traffic appears to reside in the same physical building or location without the need to purchase costly hardware or small internet circuits. This option greatly enhances a company's security posture by limiting external access to their environment. MeshNet can be configured with route and equipment redundancy for seamless failover. And from a disaster recovery standpoint, MeshNet customers can move to any location within their built mesh network and continue working and accessing any other locations. If you have interest in learning more about MeshNet service, please let us connect you with Scott Holmes, our business development specialist, for a discussion of your needs and proposal for services. As part of our Fiber to the Home project, we launched uh, residential and business class phone by providing analog phone service. In 22, we launched enterprise phone service with MPW Corporate being one of our first customers. We were a challenging customer with two physical locations, desk phones and soft phones, and third-party PBX support, but we made it, and with a lot of pre-work and testing, the transition has been very successful. In total, we have four customers taking enterprise phone service. Supply chain issues has been the biggest constraint growing this service even further. MPW saw significant cost savings compared to the charges from our former provider, and we've demonstrated similar savings for our other enterprise customers. If you have analog basic phones or a PBX, we have analog PRA and SIP services available. Again, please let us connect you with Scott Holmes, our business development specialist, for a discussion of your needs and proposal for services. We seek to help make Muscatine the best place to have a business and to live. Desirable communities have access to the best services, so we continue to look at small pockets next to our existing service area that have never had MPW communication services and budget for plant extensions. We completed three small extensions in 22, bringing gigabit internet, TV, and phone services to a new group of customers. These small new builds have prepared us for our upcoming large extensions. MPW was awarded two grants from the state of Iowa to make expanding broadband services further into the county more economically feasible, and we received additional funding commitment from the county for our NOFA 7 project. Engineering design work was completed last year for both NOFA 6 and NOFA 7, and permitting has begun. We had about a dozen bidders for our mainline construction contract and awarded the bid to Price Industrial Electric out of Cedar Rapids. Price is an experienced fiber contractor having completed work for the Iowa DOT and large middle mile internet service providers. Construction is planned to start this year for NOFA 6 and in 24 for NOFA 7. We do expect additional broadband expansion funding to become available, so we've worked with both the federal FCC and the Iowa Office of the CIO on updating high-speed broadband data maps to position ourselves for additional grant opportunities. So our, our net income, MPW's net income in 2022 was $7.7 .7 million, and that's a little more than double what we had in 2021. It's also substantially different from what we budgeted for 2022. It was a, a loss, actually, of $2.6 million, so dramatic difference. Now, why the big difference? It's largely driven by what's going on with the markets. Um, MISO markets, where we sell our energy into MISO, then we buy it back from MISO. But we sell the energy from our generation into MISO. That Those markets went off uh, much higher because the uh, natural gas prices were higher. And I'll show a graph of that later. But uh, our generation was higher than budget, but it was actually uh, lower than what we did in 2021. The uh, sales into MISO uh, were $47 million uh, above budget and $33 million above 2021. So those are just really big numbers for a utility our size. You can see here for each of the three utilities. So the first bullet point there is for uh, electric. And uh, it's uh, the 3.7% above budget, 15.5% uh, uh, below 2021 for the net generation. And then uh, water sales were uh, down from 2021. But uh, 2021, we had a big increase in our industrial sales for water. So 
we maintain that level in 2022. Communications margins, uh, 400,000 better than uh, 2021, and that's as we in continue to improve our internet margins by about 300,000. You can see there on the, the two graphs the, uh, the sharp differences, especially on the electric side, so compared to uh, budget, uh, compared to 2021. And you can see the history there of our net income. So the crazy energy markets, uh, the uh, spot natural gas prices averaged $8.81 uh, $8 in uh, August. That was the highest peak. And then uh, we saw energy prices, what we sold into MISO at $101 a megawatt hour. So if you think about that, that's $0.10 cents a kilowatt hour. And uh, if you look at many of the rates you have, they're obviously below that. So, uh, but with our generation, we were able to hedge and uh, keep your energy prices low. So uh, looking at that graph there, uh, the top two lines are uh, energy prices, what we sold into MISO, what we purchased from MISO. And you can compare that to the blue bars. Those are natural gas prices. So gas prices really started to increase in April. And they peaked up in the summertime. Then uh, you compare that to those lower set of lines for energy prices, and they're much lower for 2021. So if one of the things for uh, when you think about the rates for MPW, we kept them steady. We didn't have EACs. We didn't have an unusual uh, rate increase. There were a lot of utilities in the U.S. that couldn't do that. When I looked at uh, national EIA numbers, for example, for residential customers, it was above uh, 15 cents per kilowatt hour. Our rates were um, about 12 cents per kilowatt hour. So there, there's a substantial difference, and that difference was driven by a lot of utilities trying to pass through high natural gas costs, high energy prices. There were other utilities that couldn't get coal, uh, and uh, so they had to buy from the market. So we had a good supply of coal. Uh, we had our generation operating, and we were able to keep our rates steady. So this next slide, the... Uh, you can see a five-year history of natural gas prices, and in 2022 is when they really took off, about April of 2022. The, uh, that period there uh, of high gas prices is over now almost. So if you look at natural gas prices today, when I looked at the futures this morning for March, they're $2.5. And, a $2 and uh, the, uh, the prices here show that uh, they were much higher in 2022, the biggest sustained period uh, of or the last five years, but if you look back further than that, it's the longest sustained period of high natural gas prices. Uh, there was one of the reasons that prices dropped. There are two things. One is that we haven't had much of a winter as far as weather, so natural gas prices have dropped. Production is high. But uh, the an LNG facility in Texas had an explosion and fire in June. It's still not running yet. I don't know when it will run now. They keep saying it will run soon, but uh, that was two BCF per day of uh, natural gas that was being exported. So it's uh, a huge impact on supply and demand and keeping those prices low. So for uh, where we are on our cash position, so we did all these things with uh, in 2022. We expected to uh, reduce our cash position. We were able to maintain it with the high markets and the uh, higher net income. And we did that even with Ryan spending significant dollars on line 106. So, but less than budgeted. But the, uh, so we were able to do that without any borrowing, which was great. Uh, CapEx, when we look at it, our capital expenditures, uh, about $15 million less than budgeted, as I said. But uh, it's still significant expenditure and not having to borrow any funds. So these next three slides are just a little bit about projections. So powering the future, we've got uh, the solar PPA uh, in the chip unit that would require financing in future years. 
We've also got some other big projects, uh, the Grandview substation, which is related to, uh, in part, to uh, getting the solar uh, project done. That project's about $7 million. Uh, we've got plant cooling modifications to keep running the coal units. That's about $6 million. And then um, the new customer information system that will hit uh, capital this year. So inflation, we've got it budgeted pretty low. You see 2.8%. That seems real low right now, doesn't it? But uh, in 2023, uh, a lot of what people did is put their budgets together with higher uh, numbers than that. And we just think inflation will drop down going forward. Our investment rates, we uh, targeted 3 to 3.5%. Three We're doing better than that right now. We're doing 4.5% to 5% for our investments. And with $80 million to invest, uh, that's good for you as customers. With natural gas prices being high, we had anticipated they'd still be high in, in the first quarter of 23. But they will have dropped, and that will impact our results in 23. We won't see the same kind of net income in 23 as we saw in 2022. On the water side, uh, we've got uh, our plans are for well rehabilitation, and uh, we're trying to uh, meet water demand uh, pumping by uh, delaying wells or not putting in as many new wells, and that will save capital dollars going forward. Still evaluating it, but we're optimistic. And then large projects, some of you do probably don't know, we have, have a reservoir behind Walmart, so it's a little hidden back there, but uh, we have to spend some money to get that refurbished, and it's significant. We're also doing uh, the uh, West Hill sewer separation work uh, for our part of it, the water part of it, that project started for us, I think, in 2014. It started for the city before that. won't be done until 2028, but there are very significant dollars associated with that. One of the things we had to do on the water side was uh, borrow some money from the electric utility, uh, so uh, funding some of the projects we have on, on the water side. So that's a $2 million loan at, uh, for seven years at 4.5%. The planned rate increase shown there is what we have in our budget right now. It's significant. We've had a couple things going on. We've got the higher capital expenditures, but we also have um, higher chemical costs that uh, have gone up about 69% in 2022. And it's also, uh, their prices are about double what they were a year ago right now. That 8%. Uh, won't necessarily be the same for all classes of customer. It could be different. So we're doing a cost of service study right now. We'll be talking to our large customers about that in the near future and um, still need to evaluate that with our uh, audit and finance, finance committee and the board of directors or board of trustees. Unidate, uh, sorry Holly, one, Unidate uh, is one of the reasons for that increase as well because with taking 8A off, we're using less water at the plant, and that, uh, that means that a lot of those costs have to go back on other customers now rather than having the um, electric utility pay for some of those costs. On the comm side, uh, Erica talked about uh, NOFA 6 and 7. Uh, here the dollars are shown that NOFA 6 is about 1.5 million, NOFA 7 is about a little over 1 million. But you see the significant grants that we anticipate getting uh, up to 500000 for NOFA 6 and up to about 700000 for NOFA 7. Erica talked about internet restructuring and that uh, there, that will keep rates uh, uh, actually lower per, uh, for what the speed you get. So, uh, but we're not planning any increases on the internet side. We are anticipating increases on the video side of about 6% per year. So I always <coughs> like to take the opportunity to talk about some of the benefits of the community of having a municipal utility. So every year we update this financial analysis on the benefits and we put the benefits into kind of two key buckets. The first is lower rates. So we do a lot of benchmarking of our rates for all three utilities, electric, water, and comm. And every year we compare that to benchmark averages 
and look at what the benefit is to our customers of having our low rates. And for 2022, it actually went up significantly, the cost savings all the way to $5.4 million. A lot of that was related to lower electric rates, and I'll talk more about that at the next slide. But that's a benefit to our customers versus paying average benchmark rates that we compare against. Now, on the other side is free services to the community. It's another great benefit of being a municipal utility as we provide services like free utilities for electric and water to city facilities, street lights, and traffic signals that we uh, install, maintain, and operate, fire protection throughout the system, uh, and then customer rebates and energy services uh, for our customers that we provide. And that came up to about $2.3 million of additional uh, savings to our customers last year. So in total, in 2022, $7.7 .7 million in savings by having a municipal utility, and that's over $300 for every single, res uh, every single resident in Muscatine for 2022, so that's significant. And this is, Mark touched on this a little bit, but uh, the electric rates across the country were very volatile in 2022, primarily because of those high natural gas prices. Utilities were having to put adjustment clauses in and collect more money from their customers to offset those high natural gas costs. So we've compared, we have data through November, but in all of the customer classes, you can see the national average rate increases were significant, you know, from 11 to 18% for industrial customers. And you compare that to our actual results for rate increase uh, for our customers here in Muscatine, an average of 1.8%. Very, very stable. We had planned and budgeted for a 2% increase, so we came in a little bit under that even. But when you compare that to what was going on across the country, significant savings to our customers uh, and a huge benefit to Muscatine. So the result of that, these are our rates, our average all-in rates for each customer class um, for 2022. And you can see we've got electric here and water on the right. We continue to compare very favorably to our benchmarks uh, for both electric and water. And because of that difference in rate increases in 22, the spreads for the electric rates got even wider, so even bigger savings to our customers. And these are significant. You look at the commercial class, this difference between the national average and our rates is about 25% savings to our commercial customers. And on the industrial side, it's even greater. It's about a 28% uh, lower rate for our industrial customers than what they could see uh, on a national average basis. So. That's a significant to our large customers. And on the water rates, we continue to compare very favorably to our surrounding larger communities, uh, especially for the customers that use higher volumes of water. Because we have relatively low treatment costs for every gallon of water, those higher volumes uh, can be provided and sold at a, at a very low rate, even with those chemical cost increases that Mark talked about. By relative terms, when you compare to other communities, still very, very low. So that's what we have planned. Um, hopefully that may be a kind of a good overview of what we've been up to for 22, as well as an outlook for what we have planned financially uh, in the coming years. But happy to take any questions that you might have. Uh, do you think the natural gas markets have largely baked in the shortages caused by the conflict in Ukraine? And, or do you see uh, you know, volatility more uh, in the future? Yeah. Let Mark take this one. Turn it off. For uh, natural gas prices, uh, we're exporting the U.S. It's exporting about as much LNG as it can to Europe. So that that's really taking the natural gas out of the U.S. out of domestic supply. So uh, those prices don't have as direct impact on what's going on with us. You see a big disconnect with what prices are in Europe and what prices are here in the U.S. for natural gas. That started to narrow a little bit, but I don't think you know, what's going on in Ukraine or will have that much impact. There will be efforts to increase LNG exports from the U.S. over time, and getting that facility back uh, will uh, increase that export of LNG. So that will we'll put pressure on prices, but when we look at the forward curve right now for natural gas, it's pretty low. Thanks. Yeah, I think, as Mark saying, you definitely see that big spread because the U.S. is kind of capped out on what it can export. But I think that dynamic is going to continue to maintain as demand in other parts of the world increase for gas and the U.S. continues to have a low cost production, uh, you'll continue to see increase in exports um, and that will have an indirect impact on the price. Of the gas. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I didn't catch it. Did you say what the rate increase was planned for the electric utility? So it's we're expecting modest, uh, somewhere around one to two percent. I'd say. Um, I think we in our budget we estimate about one, one point one percent base rate. And but we're we're in the middle of a cost of service study now that we're working with our uh, outside consultants to do, and we'll be bringing back to the audit finance committee and the board in March. But I would expect the base rate to be probably in that one to two percent range. And the other thing we're doing there is uh, looking at how it allocates among customer class again, just like the water side. So you could see different increases for different classes of customers. Yeah. So coming off of that really strong year in twenty two sets us up well for a low. Next year. And do you keep a chart of your historical rate increases over time? Is that is that available to? Uh, it, yeah, it could be. We do um, when we do any rate adjustment to the board. We that's one of the things we provide is that kind of historical uh, rate adjustment table. But I can certainly get that to you. Okay, thank you. Last year you talked about uh, the decommissioning of, of current uh, units and. Uh, could you touch on the decommissioning of nine, if that time frame is still the same going forward, and if the planning and, and construction of a natural gas fired uh, facility is still on where you were a year ago, or is that altered? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think that those details are the things we'll be talking about with the board at the February meeting. We'll be sharing at that customer forum on March 6th. As Doug said, when we're coming from the last study, uh, we were following up on a lot of those plans, and we have updated assumptions on costs and operational details for that chip unit, and now we've put back into the model for the power supply study. So we plan to review kind of our updated outlook on things. Uh, so um, more to come just in the next couple weeks as far as details on that. Very good. But I, I would say in general, though, one of the big themes that's different from 2019, 2020, when we did the last study to today, is the market the MISO market has gotten much more strained on their capacity outlook uh, for a long long time MISO had excess capacity so they didn't have much value in the market and as we've seen more retirements of baseload units um, that that balance of capacity and demand has really shrunk and actually in the last year's capacity auction MISO was short on firm capacity in the auction so that's definitely different from three years ago that outlook on the balance of capacity so the value of having capacity installed in the ground is definitely higher now than it was a few years ago. So that's one of the big assumptions that we baked into the current study. 